Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, my name is Sadie, and I'm going to be moderating and making sure um, we keep track of everything that comes in. Um, you can put any questions you have throughout the talk in the Q&A feature, or you could pop them in the chat if that's easier. Um, we're going to try and answer them as we go, like at the ends of slides and at good breaking points. But uh, some questions may make more sense to keep to the end. And if you have any lingering questions at the end, feel free to answer, um, ask them then. So today our speaker is Katie Zimmerman, who is the Director of Copyright Strategy for the MIT Libraries. And I'm going to hand it over to Katie to get started. All right, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the public domain, which is a repository of things that you can use with free of copyright. Um, very exciting and sometimes a little bit tricky to find out what is in the public domain and what isn't. So this is going to be a, a very pr practical walk through the public domain today. Um, so what we're going to cover, we're going to cover what is the public domain, how you determine copyright status, and how you put that into practice. Um, so what is the public domain? There are a couple of ways that things get into the public domain. Um, things can be not copyrightable to begin with. Things can be works of the US federal government. Works can be placed into the public domain by their creators, or things can be in the public domain once their copyright has expired, which is mainly what we're gonna focus on. Uh, but before we jump into that category, let's look briefly at the other categories. Um, so there are plenty of things that um, are not copyrightable to begin with. Not everything is subject to the co copyright. Um, the most notable categories of things that are, um, things that seem like they might be copyrightable but are not, are facts, ideas, and insufficiently creative arrangements of facts and ideas. So um, facts and ideas are things that just exist out in the world. Uh, the law doesn't think that anyone should have exclusive uh, exclusive control over that under copyright. Uh, there may be other intellectual property, uh, intellectual properties that could apply there, but not copyright. Um, and then you can get copyright in um, in arrangements of otherwise uncopyrightable elements, but only to a certain degree. So there are some things that are uncopyrightable and therefore in the public domain that way. Um, the next category is government documents. So this is by statute. So um, works uh, copyright protection is not available for any work of the United States government, one of the simpler statements in uh, the Copyright Act. Um, the one caveat that I will put on that is that it is works of the United States government, which means the federal government only, actually. Um, so that doesn't apply to works of state governments, works of municipal governments, county governments, uh, stuff like that. And those may or may not be under copyright. Um, frequently they will be. This map down here is from a project I did a number of years ago to uh, help identify the copyright status, the default copyright status of government documents in the 50 states. You can see most of them are copyrightable to some degree. Um, Florida and California being outliers in that, uh, in that they have uh, they they have had court cases that have actually determined that their documents are not by default un um, copyrighted. But that is a little bit of a tangent. But you can rely on works of the U.S. federal government being in the public domain. So and that includes some cool materials. That includes NASA photos. That includes um, committee reports. Uh, lots of interesting materials there. Okay, works can also be placed into the public domain by their creator. So uh, one easy way to do that is with the CC0 mark. So if you're familiar with Creative Commons licenses, this is a similar similar principle. And this, this is a way that you as a creator, if you don't want to put any sort of restrictions on reuse of your work, can do that and allow people and let everyone that, see, that sees it know that yes, this is available for, for use. Um, so you can put this mark on the work, then people know that they can use it as if it were in the public domain. Um, and you might wanna do, do that for things um, that you want to be freely built on that you don't have any particular attachment to for, um, that you, for attribution or uh, monetization or anything like that. And 
it makes it, it facilitates greater reuse for materials in that way. Uh, but if you haven't done that, and if the creator hasn't done that, then copyright applies by default. So as soon as you create something that is copyrightable, so not a fact, not an idea, but something that is copyrightable, so an original work of scholarship fixed in a tangible medium of expression, um, as soon as you create that, it has a copyright. Um, and copyright lasts for a long time, but it does last for a limited time. Um, this is the text from the Constitution that gives us all of intellectual property, basically. Um, and it is to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. Uh, so this is the writings portion of that. And what we're mainly gonna be exploring today is what we mean by limited times. Um, so copyright lasts for a very long time and it has expanded over the course of uh, its existence. So currently for something you create today, uh, copyright lasts for the life of the person who created, creates it, the life of the author plus 70 years. So something that you create today, this slideshow that I've created, uh, any notes you might be taking, anything that is copyrightable um, that you're creating today lasts for your entire lifetime and then 70 years beyond that. Um, copyright initially started off being much shorter. It started out with a 28 year duration in the United States uh, with, um, and actually in, in Great Britain in 1790 with um, the Statute of Anne. It's a um, 28 year duration. At various points over the years, it has expanded. It went from 28 to 28, and then you could renew it for a second term and get, so you could get two of those basically if you, if you submitted a uh, renewal application. Um, and then it has gradually stepped up in copyright acts over the years to get to our current length. Um, and the mechanics of when uh, the mechanics of these different acts interacting with each other gives us some variation when we're dealing with historical materials, particularly. Um, so to kind of illustrate this, uh, let's imagine a work first created in uh, 1923. So the work was created in 1923. It received an initial copyright term when it was created of 28 years. In that 28th year, the renewal window for that for that work would be open. If the creator renewed it, it would have then gotten another 28 years. So if it's not renewed, it enters the public domain in 1952. Um, if it is renewed, then it would have entered the public domain in 1980. Um, in 1976, there was a big uh, reform of the, uh, of the copyright statute that, that most of our current copyright law stems from the uh, 1976 Copyright Act that reformulated the length of copyright, um, which resulted in a longer term. So now that work from 1923 would have uh, entered the public domain um, in 1999, um, after its 75th year, I believe it's, unless I've got my math wrong. Um, then, in 19, then in 1998, however, there was, a, uh, there was an act um, to, expand copyright again. Um, the, the, uh, the, the gossip, as it were, for this act is that uh, Mickey Mouse was going to be entering the public domain soon in the form of Steamboat Willie. Um, this is the copyright term, this is the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. Um, and it was enacted, it added another 20 years onto all of the copyright terms um, that were then in effect. So that work first created in 1923, instead of going to the public domain in 1999, it, it went into the public domain now in 2019. Um, and then in 2019, now the, and uh, this, this would be true for anything created in, in uh, 1923. So that date is now a rolling date. Um, and works enter the public domain by calendar year Every year, we're currently up to 1926. Works from 1926 entered the public domain this past January 1st. Um, we got a bunch of new movies. Um, also, 
a bunch of new books, a bunch of new sound recordings for the first time, thanks to some new legislation from this year. Um, and that, and uh, that will keep, keep rolling so we will get 1927 next year and so on. Okay, so that's kind of the theory. Uh, but let's say you have something from the 20th century and you want to know if it's in the public domain or not. How do you figure that out? Um, so there are a couple of resources that are really good for this. Um, they are linked in these slides, which are also in the chat and, and will be shared again um, as we go on. Um, this first one is a handbook put out by a, uh, a law school clinic that is really good at walking you through what the decision points are, what facts you need, what, um, what information you need uh, in order to make these determinations. Um, there it is, I didn't actually need to click on that. <laughs> um, and then the other is this extremely helpful chart from uh, Cornell University that gives you the year of publication and then the information you need in order to make that decision. So those are the primary resources that we're going to be using today and we'll see a little bit how to make them. Um, so okay, so some kind of beginning uh, beginning guidelines and uh, the, the limit the scope of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, first, I am mostly going to be talking about printed media, so I'm mostly going to be talking about um, books, written written material, that could be pamphlets, that could be serials, that could be newspapers, um, but mostly the printed word. Um, that does make a difference in some of the things we're going to be talking about. Um, the general principles generally also apply to uh, audiovisual works and music, but both of those categories uh, have their own quirks occasionally. Um, so we are going to be mostly focusing on printed media. Um, and the other big caveat for today is um, that I'm talking about U.S. law. So this is all uh, this is all about things that are um, in the United States and also things published in the United States, which can in fact be a uh, a large caveat on this. Um, uh, copyright laws are uh, copyright laws um, generally apply to the country that creates the law. Um, and that means that it can sometimes get very, very confusing with international, with uh, cross, cross borders with copyright law. We're mainly going to be focusing on U.S. copyright law today. Uh, you have to know the law of the place you're in before you can start getting into the harder questions. Um, there are countries around the world that have longer copyright terms than the United States. There aren't a whole lot, but Mexico has a copyright term of the life of the author plus 90 years. Um, so uh, in general, US copyright law is, uh, well, yeah, in general, we are of a similar length and I have a very distracting cat trying to distract me from my presentation. Okay, um, so other general caveats here, um, the scope of materials that we're, that we're talking about is roughly 1927 to, actually it's very precisely 1927 to 1989. Um, the reason for that is, um, as I said a little bit earlier, the, um, the copyrights for works in um, works published in the United States in 1926 have just entered the public domain, the longest possible um, the longest possible restrictions on those have now expired. So in general, if it's created in the United States before 1927, um, which is a rolling date, next year it will be 1928. Um, but if it's created before the 1920s, before 1926, um, it is probably in the public domain. Um, similarly, if it is after 1989, it is probably not in the public domain. There's um, there's in, in less, unless the creator has put a CC0 mark on it or otherwise volunteered it into the public domain or it's a work of the federal government or something like that, then it's not going to be in the public domain if it was created after 1989. Um, and then finally, we are going to be mostly talking about works that are published and created in the United States. Okay. 
Um, so we have a set of guiding questions for figuring out if something is in the public domain. Um, it is what, where, when, uh, does it have a copyright notice and has the copyright notice, has the copyright in the work been renewed? Um, so let's go through those. So uh, by the question what, um, what I mean is what type of thing is the work you're looking at? And by that, I mean, what sort of copyrighted work? Is it copyrighted? Is it maybe uh, uncopyrightable subject matter? But if it is copyrightable subject matter, are we in the category of looking at textual materials? Are we, is this music? Um, this is just kind of a general mental check for um, what sort of thing are we talking about here? And we'll see how, um, the answer to that might play into the might play into the information we're looking for later on. And then the other big category here is, is this thing that you're looking at published or unpublished? And what does that mean? And why does it matter? Um, so there are different duration rules. There are different rules for how long copyright lasts for unpublished works versus published works. Um, there are Compli relatively complicated reasons for that, but um, current copyright law does not really treat any, does not make any sort of distinction between published and unpublished works, but previous versions of the copyright law did, and those historical distinctions matter in some cases. Um, so unpublished works are generally a little bit simpler. Um, unpublished works were not protected by federal copyright until that 1976 Copyright Act. Uh, and the 1976 Copyright Act brought them into the federal fold and it actually did it in a fairly uniform way. Um, so for unpublished works that have never been formally published, the copyright, the copyright term is the same as for works created today. So it's the life of the author plus 70 years. So that would be works from authors who died before 1952 at this point. Um, and if you don't have an author whose life you can measure, if it's anonymous, pseudonymous, created by a corporation, um, or if you just don't know the death date of the author, then that is approximated as 120 years from the date of creation, which would be works created before 1902. Um, and that does give us a caveat to our earlier assumption of if it's created before 1927, you're good. That's true if it's published. If it's unpublished, you, you may have to do a little bit more due diligence there. Um, okay, so that is unpublished works, but I can hear you asking, how do I know if something is published or not? Um, so we do end up with a category of what I'm calling kind of published works. Um, so this was, when, when this distinction existed under the law, this was in fact a question that came up and courts had to decide whether things were published or not. Um, and the distinction under the 1909 Copyright Act, which is where these rules come from, uh, was very important because if something was published, there were very strict, um, as we will see, there were very strict requirements that had to be met in order to get copyright protection. And that sometimes resulted in, if you accidentally published something, if, you pub if something was more public than you intended, then you could lose copyright protection in that. So courts were sympathetic to that, they didn't want people to lose their rights. Um, and so we ended up with some, uh, some, some distinctions for when you could still have copyright protection, even if you didn't satisfy the criteria for publication. Um, so general publication is what we generally think of as published. That's, you can buy this book. This book has been made available in shelves, made available, made available in libraries, generally speaking, made available to the public regardless of who they are and the intended use of those people. Um, and that is, the, um, that is the category of published works that most of the rules we're gonna be talking about apply to. Um, uh, limited publication is this category that the courts came up with for um, when something didn't really satisfy the criteria for general publication, but they felt like it should be treated as an unpublished work. Um, and uh, and still get still get some protection as an unpublished work. So these are works that are only available through public performance or exhibition. Um, the 
the case that resulted in that rule is um, is an interesting one. That that comes from uh, Martin Luther King's "I uh, Had a Dream" speech, extremely public speech, hundreds thousands of people on the on the the National Mall in Washington D.C. listening to him give this very very famous address. Uh, it went out on the radio. It went out on television. Um, he was not handing out little slips of paper with a copyright notice on it. Um, and the question, and so the question was, is this a copy? It was that published such that uh, he hadn't satisfied the requirements for um, for including a copyright notice on it, which was part of the requirements of the time. Um, and that was, um, and the court ultimately determined that it was, um, it, it was a limited, it was a limited publication. It didn't count as general publication and therefore he could get protection in that. Um, so that's one way that something can be a limited publication. And that is if it's only available through public performance or exhibition. Um, and then um, another category is if it is made available to a limited group for a limited purpose. And you can think of this as like confidential reports, something that it has uh, do not distribute stamped on it, something that's very clearly only 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 um, submitted to a limited group for a limited purpose, not to the general public. public. Um, and for those works, you would use the rules for unpublished works. Uh, Katie, we have a question about whether just posting something online counts as general publication. Yeah, so it is a good question. Um, I think it uh, I think by these criteria, it probably would be. So it would be um, making available to the public regardless of who they are and their intended use. Um, perhaps you could get into some uh, some nuances with if you put terms of use on something and that clearly limit the use, uh, that would be kind of interesting. But in practice, um, in practice, at least for these for these purposes, um, publication no longer matters on publication basically hasn't mattered for copyright purposes on anything created while the internet has been around. Um, so the distinction between uh, general publication and limited publication went away in the 1976 Copyright Act. So there was there were some forms of the internet in 1976, but not many. Um, so it doesn't it. it for practical purposes, it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, the, the materials that we'll be looking at for this are things published before then. Okay, um, so our next kind of guiding question is where, and this is really a, uh, a mental check for, are we talking about a US work? Because things do get more complicated when we're not talking about something that was published in the United States. Um, the background here is that for most of the 20th century, U.S. protection required compliance with U.S. law and U.S. copyright formalities. So um, as, we're, as we're about to see, those, those requirements were pretty stringent. You had to have a notice in a particular format located in a particular position, um, and the U.S.'s formal legal position um, for a very long time was that if you didn't do that, you didn't get copyright protection in the United States. So you could be publishing a book in Germany, you could be publishing a book in Japan. Uh, if you don't have the, uh, the copyright with a symbol in it, the C with a hmm, speaking today, um, if you don't have the, uh, the C with a circle around it and the date as we're about to, as we're about to see, um, then you didn't get copyright protection in the U.S. Someone in the U.S. could freely copy your work. Um, that was uh, there was that was seen as inequitable. Um, actually, uh, Charles Dickens has some very colorful things to say about the U.S. about that. Uh, this was uh, we're we're going to talk about 1991, but uh, Charles Dickens was not talking about it in 1991. He was about a hundred years before that. Um, but he accused the United States of being a country, a country of pirates because uh, many of his works were published in, in the UK. They weren't in compliance with US formalities. Uh, American publishers would, would print them and not give him, he wouldn't receive any royalties from that. Um, he was extremely upset about American copyright law. 
Uh, we did not do anything for Mr. Dickens, but we did do something, something for people in similar positions. In uh, 1991, we passed a copyright amendment to uh, rectify the situation. This resulted in uh, what's referred to as copyright restoration. Uh, there were many things that um, under the previous way things worked would have been seen as in the public domain because they were published in another country and weren't compliant with, compliant with US uh, copyright requirements. Um, but those were, if they weren't in the public domain in their home country, they were brought, brought out of the public domain in the United States. And it's the only example of things being in the public domain and then coming out of it, usually that's a one-way street. Usually once it's in the public domain, it stays in the public domain. Uh, but that is the one category where things that were in the public domain were, were hauled back out of the public domain by force of law. Um, and that actually can be pretty confusing if you're trying to figure out if a German or Japanese book from the 50s is protected by copyright in the United States. Um, so. That is, a, uh, that is a complicated area that um, generally, if you're dealing with a book that is published outside of the United States, um, it is okay if it is published outside of the United States and within the United States at the same time. So you get a lot of books that are published in London and New York at the same time. That's fine. That still counts as a US work for these purposes. Um, but if it was exclusively published in London or exclusively published somewhere else, um, then that ups, the, uh, that ups the complexity of the situation significantly, and we're not going to be able to go into that today. Um, so what might that look like? Uh, this is one example book from the MIT libraries. Uh, you can see this is the first couple pages of the book. It's a book about Niels Bohr. Um, from the title page on the front, uh, we see New York, the publisher, Al uh, Alfred Pomf, 1923. It looks pretty much like a U.S. publication, um, but when you flip the page, we have this little note. We have the original title in Danish, and we have a note saying that this is translated from the Danish um, in 1923, which might be a hint that there is actually an earlier publication that is a form that uh, isn't published in the United States. So that might be a sign that there might be some complications that Danish work could be potentially still in copyright in the United States. Um, okay, so now let's talk about publication date. So this here is a screenshot of the Cornell chart, which uh, the link has been shared to. Um, and this chart is a really handy, uh, really useful tool for figuring out what requirements were in place at different years um, for publications. So you can see if, the, if something was published between 1978 and, 19, uh, and 1989, and it was published without a copyright notice and wasn't subsequently registered, then it's in the public domain. Um, and so you can use this to kind of figure out which category the work you're looking at is in in these first two count columns. And then it'll tell you what the copyright, copyright term is for that work or when it will enter the public domain. Um, so this requires gathering some information from the book. Um, the things that you are going to be looking for are generally a publication date and a copyright notice. Um, this is another example of a work from the MIT Libraries Collections. Um, and usually this is going to be on what's helpfully called the copyright page. It's supposed to be the page following the title page. And here you can see we have a copyright notice, 1923 by George H. Duran Company. Um, here's another example. This is a smaller book. This is a little pamphlet, a couple of pages. Um, the, this is the front cover. Then you open it up, you see this blank page, and then it starts right in at the forward. This circled date here, um, I flipped through this entire little booklet, and that is the only date that appears anywhere in it. Um, so sometimes it'll be really obvious. Sometimes you have to dig a little bit more for the information in the book. 
Um, so what else are we looking for? Our next kind of guiding question is the copyright notice. So notice was required under the 1909 Copyright Act. This is a uh, screenshot of what that looked like in the 1909 Act because that is basically unreadable. Um, we also have a very helpful, helpful table here. Um, this is from one of the resources that I pointed out earlier. Um, this summarizes everything in, uh, in that statute and tells you what you're looking for based on the type of materials. So if we're in a book or a printed publication, the copyright notice required in order to receive copyright protection under the 1909 Act is um, the copyright symbol, the C with a circle around it, COPR period, or the word copyright, the year of first publication, and the author's name. So copyright 1974, Jane Doe. There are also specific places that it has to appear. So it has to be on the title page or the page immediately following the title page. And the intention here, I believe, is to make it easy to find so that uh, someone who wants to know the copyright information about this work doesn't have to go digging for it. Um, so, you, so it's supposed to be in a standard location. It's supposed to contain standard information. And if it doesn't contain that information, then the um, then it doesn't get copyright protection under the rules of the 1909 Act. Um, similar rules for other types of things, but different places it can appear. Um, the most notable the most notable differences are when you get uh, to pictorial, graphical, or sculptural works. Um, for those works, there's a short form that's acceptable because they realized that uh, copyright date name could be a lot to stamp onto a sculpture, for example. Um, so there's a short form that works. It's the, the it uh, basically just omits the date, um, and it has and uh, a sculpture does not have a title page. So where do you put it? It is supposed to be in a, an accessible place, such as the margin, back, permanent base, or pedestal of the work. Um, so that's where you look for that. Um, so let's revisit this little pamphlet here. So this is um, our 1923 pamphlet on endocrine enzymes and protein compounds. Um, as I pointed out, this is the only place in the book that a date appears. And let's see, does it satisfy our requirements for a copyright notice? Um, I will flip back to the chart. Uh, and feel free to jump into the chat and say, is this, is this a satisfactory copyright notice? So I will, I will end the suspense. This is not a, a adequate copyright notice. Um, uh, this is, uh, so this type of work, this is either a book or a periodical. I think it's probably a book. Doesn't make a difference in uh, what, what copyright notice elements it has. Um, we have, let's see, what do we have? We, I suppose we perhaps have the copyright claimant, it could be this company that is producing this, this thing. I, it's not really quite in the same place. It doesn't have the C with a circle or the word copyright or the acceptable abbreviation. Um, it's also not in the right place. Uh, it's, not on, it's not on the title page or the page immediately after the title page. The page immediately after the title page is this completely blank page in the middle here. Um, so this does not satisfy the requirements for copyright protection. So this work actually would have been in the public domain from when it was first created in August 1923. So uh, we digitized this a few years ago. It actually could have been uh, could have been copied without any sort of copyright concerns far before then. It could have been copied in 1923. Um, but so this work was in the public domain from the beginning.
Um, and there are reasons why uh, someone who's creating something may want something to not be in, uh, to not be under copyright protection. Um, this work in particular seems to be, uh, it's, it's a reference for, uh, produced by a company that is making, um, making things to sell to chemists, basically. And so this is, this is essentially advertising for them. It's an informative booklet. It has, uh, it has information about these products that could be, that, uh, could be of educational or academic interest but they're they're distributing it basically because they want you to sell their uh, because they want you to buy their product not because they want you to buy their book so it makes sense to me that this wouldn't be uh, that they wouldn't have put a copyright notice on this because they didn't want to restrict its use they wanted it to circulate as widely as possible so that more people would buy difco enzymes um, so that is one so, um, so yeah, that is what you're looking for in the copyright notice. Lack of an appropriate copyright notice is the main way that uh, things from the early 20th century can be in the public domain. Um, the, uh, we have another example here. Um, this is a photo from the interior of the book. We have uh, packing butter for shipment in Amsterdam. And we have a little copyright notice on this um, on this photo here. Is that sufficient for uh, satisfying notice requirement and getting copyright protection? Um, it, you can see uh, you can see it does not have a date, but it is a pictorial, graphical, or sculptural work, so it it um, is eligible for the short form. Um, and the short form can be the symbol, the word copyright, and then the author or copyright holder's name. So what we have here is copyright Keystone Buco. That satisfies the requirement for the short form that is applicable to, um, to photos. They could have put the whole thing. They weren't required to. They met the, they met the requirements. This is a satisfactory copyright notice for this type of work. Okay, um, so a quick note about copyright registration. Um, so copyright registration is not required to receive a copyright. Things are copyrighted and uh, were copyrighted even under the 1909 Act as soon as they were created. Um, a copyright registration is required for certain things. If you want to enforce your copyright in the court, you have to register it. Uh, and there are certain perks to registration. Um, you can't... Uh, most notably, you can't enforce your copyright on anything that happened before you registered. So you have to register um, prior to the infringement in order to get the protection of the courts. Um, and the idea there is you can look up what has been registered and know what is protected. Um, but copyright registrations sometimes have useful information. Uh, you can look them up. They are, uh, they are also helpful for... Um, they're also sometimes helpful to look up when we are looking at renewal records, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. Um, but for interest, this is what a copyright registration looks like. This is the 1929 copyright registration for A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. Uh, you can see it has the name of the applicant, um, the information about the publication of the book, the uh, the copyright notice, and most notably, there is a registration number that is sometimes helpful down at the bottom here. Okay, so registration is not a requirement, but uh, you, if you remember how uh, I mentioned that early copyright was structured into two periods. So there's the initial term of copyright, and then you've got a renewal. And if and renewal at first was something that you had to actively apply for. Um, at some point, it became in 1964. Actually, it became automatic. Prior to 1964, you had to actively apply for copyright renewal. Um, and if you didn't, if you didn't apply for it, then the work fell into the public domain at that point after 28 years. Uh, so uh, there's some interesting data about this, incidentally. Um, there's, there's evidence that only about 15% of books um, were ever renewed when this was the law. 
um, which suggests that uh, the longer copyright term was not actually desired by the majority of copyright holders um, because they could have filed for that right and they didn't. Um, and if they didn't, those works are available for us today as well. Um, so knowing whether something has been renewed or not is the other key, uh, the other key piece of information you need to find if you're trying to figure out if something is in the public domain. Um, so as I mentioned, renewals became automatic in 1964. So 1964 is another one of those pivotal dates um, where the rules change because before 1964, you're looking for a renewal record. After 1964, you don't need to look for the record because you can assume it was renewed. Um, and renewals must be filed during the 28th year of the initial copyright term. So this is important for when you're trying to find a renewal record because you need to be looking for records in the year 28 years after um, the initial publication of the work. So if we go back to A Room of One's Own, it was published in 1929, 28 years after 1929, we're gonna be looking for a renewal record in 1957. Um, so how do you find renewal records? Um, this is, uh, this is a this is a surprisingly difficult reference task. You would really hope that uh, it, it would be easy to look these up. It uh, is getting better, but it is not quite there yet. So I'm going to show you the uh, I'm going to show you the hard way, and then I'll show you the easy way, um, both so that you appreciate the easy way, um, but also so that you can look it up the hard way if you need to, which you do still for certain sorts of uh, materials. Um, so this is an extremely useful website uh, put together by people who realized the need for looking up these records. Um, so the way these, the way this was done, we're, we're talking about uh, pre the pre-internet records, um, and the way that copyright registration and renewal records were kept was they were published in a really big book uh, twice a year. So you can look those up in that book. Um, those books for every year have been digitized, they are online, they are not necessarily in the most user-friendly format, but they are at least all collected here in one place. Um, so if we're looking at our, um, if we're looking at our Virginia Woolf example, we said we were looking for a renewal in 1957, so we could click on this year for the 1957 renewal and registration records. Um, then there are, um, there are a lot of things that are copyrighted in the United States. These are very big books. Um, there, are, there are links that will get you to um, all of the subsections for different parts. Um, we're, talking, we're talking about a book, so we're going to look at books. And then you can jump to the specific section for renewals, um, which is the sort of record we're looking for. These are also generally published in two volumes. So there's a volume for January to June and there's a volume for July to December. And you need to look through both of them. Um, so once you've gotten to the right section of this tome, you can then search for it. Uh, in this case, I was able to search in the text. Um, this, particular, uh, this particular one I think is digitized in HathiTrust and we can find our renewal record. Um, so here it is, it was renewed. Um, the work is by Virginia Woolf. We have the title, we have the original copyright date, um, the copyright registration number. Um, Leonard Wolf is the person who submitted the renewal um, and it, it is effective as of 26th February, uh, 1957. So this work was renewed. We have a valid renewal record, this work is still in copyright. Okay, that's the hard way. Um, here's the easier way. Um, and so this is a database that was put together to make this significantly more searchable. Um, it is at this URL, it is very useful, um, and it is but it is useful for um, the most common subset of records you need to search. There are quite a lot of these records. It is not available for everything. Um, they've added records for um, books, 
but not um, not music, not audiovisual works, uh, not some of those other categories. So this only applies to uh, what are called Class A books and Class A records in in this, which is basically books. Um, and they've only digitized the records. Uh, they've only done the records from 1923 to 1963, uh, which are the years where. Um, a renewal record and it makes the difference between it being public domain and not. So this is super useful. I usually go to this first. This is a much easier interface to search. It has all of the data broken out. Um, it is much easier to use. If you really want to be certain of something, um, if you're trying to prove that something is in the public domain so that you can use it, you're in an awkward position because you're trying to prove a negative, right? You're trying to show that this record doesn't exist. Um, so depending on depending on what you want to do, how risky you think it is, um, you may want to search here and then also follow up using uh, using the other records in order to be confident that there isn't a record that you're missing. Okay, so I have summary, um, and I apologize the formatting went a little bit wonky on this slide. Um, so if something is published prior to 1927, and again, that is a rolling date, it is 1927 this year, it'll be 1928 next year. Um, but if it's published prior to 1927, it is in the public domain. If it is published in the United States prior to 1927, it is in the public domain. Um, if it is published between 1927 and 1964, then you need to be looking for a renewal record to find out if it was renewed. If there's no renewal record, then it's in the public domain. Um, and if it's published prior to 1989, then it also requires the copyright notice. So then, then that's another way that it can be, uh, that's another method for getting it, for getting to the public domain is if it doesn't have that copyright notice. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and look at these. Um, so I'm going to take us out of presentation mode, and we're going to actually do this for a couple of books. So I have two examples here. I have links to these here if you would like to follow along. Um, but these are books that I picked out. They're both books uh, from 1944, random year, just books that looked kind of interesting to me. Um, this book is called Skyride. Um, I think it is, um, I think it's a children's book. I'm actually not sure. I haven't opened it completely. Um, this is the Internet Archive uh, book viewer interface, which even if the, um, so the Internet Archive doesn't seem to know whether this is in copyright or not. They're they seem to be assuming that it is. Um, but even when something is in copyright, they let you see the first couple of pages. So we've got Nice end paper. Um, here's the title page of our book, Skyride by Catherine Pollock, illustrated by Ruth Wood, 1944, Charles Scribner's and Sons, New York. Um, and here's our copyright page. So we can we at least have access to the information we need uh, in order to find this out. So what information are we looking at? Uh, what type of work is it? This is a book. Um, just a, in this case, this is just a reminder that this is a, that we are in the class A territory and we're not looking at music here. Um, is it published or unpublished? Well, this certainly looks pretty published. This is a, this is a pretty normal standard book. Um, we're not looking at someone's letters from an archive. We're not looking at uh, something that was in limited distribution. This looks like it was a pretty normal book. So we're in a published, we're in the published category. Um, we have the word New York here. Where is it? Here it is. Um, we have New York here. So this was published in the United States, as far as we can tell. Um, we might want to do some research outside of the book itself if, this, if it were really important that uh, we determine that this, this is in the public domain um, independently, then we might want to do some external research and try and find information on where this was published, but just based on this, this at least initially looks like it's published in the United States. Um, when was it published? We have, we have a date on there, it's 1944. Uh, does it require a copyright notice? 
So for that, I'm going to go to the Cornell chart. Uh, this is this is what it looks like in um, this is what it looks like on the web page. And we're in 1944, and um, I believe we are in this category. So this is works first first published in the United States uh, between 27 and 77. So if it was published without a copyright notice, it's in the public domain. So um, it did require, so we're in the category where it requires a, a copyright notice. Does it have one? And let's zoom in a little bit. Oops. So we have copyright 1944 by Charles Scribner's sons. Oops, I keep clicking, sorry about that. Um, all rights reserved, no part of this book may be reproduced in any form without the permission of Charles Scribner's sons. Pretty standard copyright notice. Does it satisfy our requirements? Um, let me just jump back to those. So our requirements are copyright date and the name of the claimant. I'm pretty sure we have that here. Copyright date, name of the claimant. So we have a satisfactory copyright notice. Um, it needs a copyright notice, but we have a satisfactory copyright notice, so we're good. Um, so, so far it is not in the public domain. Um, did it need to be renewed? So we can also get that from the Peter Hurdle chart. Um, there are, um, there, this is one thing to note about this chart actually is that there are multiples in this category. So we're in this box, but we're also in this box. Um, and so we are looking for a renewal or before that 1964 date where renewal became automatic. So we're looking for, um, we're looking for a renewal record. Um, let's go ahead and do that. I will use the easy, the easy method first. This is the Stanford And the book we're looking for, the title of it is Skyride. You can search either by title or by author. And here we go. Yeah, we've got Skyride. Catherine Pollock is the author. I remember that illustrator. So we have a renewal record. It was renewed um, in February of 1972. So this book is still under copyright uh, and is not in the public domain. Um, so let's look at another one. Uh, this is another book from 1944 that I thought looked interesting. It's called Introducing Africa. Um, maybe you would be interested in looking at this book if you were looking at uh, historiography or the representation of Africa over time. Um, this is apparently, um, I did a little bit of research on this book. This is apparently a relatively notable early book about Africa written by a um, um, British explorer and, and really, really early television personality. So it's a travel writer and, this, and um, had some of the very first um, travel television shows came from this author. Um, so it might be kind of interesting to find out uh, what he said about Africa. Um, so again, we have the front matter of this book, interesting end paper. Um, other books. Here's our title page, Introducing Africa, Carvel Wells. Um, and here's our copyright page. So copyright 1944 by the author, Carvel Wells. Um, so we let's look at where we are in the Peter Hurdle chart. Um, we do seem to have a copyright notice. It's right here. And by this point, hopefully you're getting familiar with what it needs. It needs something to indicate copyright, the date, and the claimant. We have all of those, so we have a satisfactory copyright notice here. Um, and so then the question is, was this renewed? Because we are, uh, it was published before 1964, uh, so if it wasn't renewed, then this is in the public domain. Um, so let's go ahead and search for it. 
Um, I'm going to search for the title. This is again in the Stanford database. Um, introducing Africa. Okay, and this time I'm not finding it. I don't know if it's case sensitive or not. It doesn't seem to make a difference. I'm going to check by the author as well. Um, the relevant person to search here, by the way, is um, it could be the author, but it's probably whoever is listed as the copyright holder here. That's who's going to be in the registration records. The author may be in there if the copyright holder is separate from the author, but the copyright holder is. Uh, a little bit uh, more likely than that. Okay, so we have a couple of books by Carveth Wells that are coming up. We have this book about Africa, but this is a different book that he wrote about Africa. Uh, we have a book about the Mediterranean, a book about the Malay jungle, another book about the jungle, but we do not have this title. Um, so this is actually, this is fairly good evidence that this particular book was not renewed. Um, just to be sure, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of poking around in the records. So um, I'm going to go to the overall index for the records. And I am looking for, what am I looking for? I'm looking for 1944 plus 28, which is 1972. Someone correct me if I've done that math wrong. That happens. Um, and I'm looking for books and I'm looking for the renewal records and I am going to have to check part one and part two. I'm going to have to check January to June and July to December. Um, so these books, um, you can see the, the scans are in a variety of platforms. Most all of them have a search within function. Um, I'm going to go ahead and search for the title. Whoa. Um, and I'm getting hits, but these are all on individual words. These are introducing, introducing something, something about Africa, but not introducing Africa. Um, I'm not seeing it that way. Um, if I try Wells, I'm going to get quite a lot of hits. So actually what I'm going to do is, um, let's see, I'm go back to, um, you can see it jumped me down to, the, the link jumped me down to the renewal registrations and I'm looking, and these are by name and I'm looking for Wells, so I'm just going to jump all the way to the end. Um, because this is organized like a book and you have to find things alphabetically. Um, so I'm looking for Wells, Walker, Warner, Weather, Welch, Wells. All right, let me zoom in a little bit so that we can see this. Um, different spelling, Wells, Carolyn, Well, F, Grace, Helen, John, Walter, and then we're into different words. So I'm not seeing any renewal registration for um, our author uh, Carveth here. Um, and I will not put you through the pain of try of checking that in the other four volumes. I did that earlier today. Um, I am relatively confident that the, this that the copyright in this book was not renewed and this book is in fact in the public domain. So you could make copies of this available. Um, you could do interesting things with, with this book if you liked because it was not under copyright. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense of uh, what this looks like, what we're doing here. Um, I do have a worksheet that you that you are welcome to um, work through if you would like. I'm putting the link into the chat there. Um, that has uh, examples from the MIT libraries. Uh, a few years ago, I walked through the stacks and picked out books that looked interesting and uh, just made made pictures of 
the copyright page and the title page of them for you. Um, you are welcome to take a look at those and um, and see if you can figure out if they're in the public domain, if you could do interesting things with them, if you could digitize them. Um, and then uh, after that, I just have um, information. So once you've figured out that something is in the public domain, it's nice to share that information with the world so that the next person doesn't have to uh, comb through ren renewal records when they want to use it. Um, this is a standardized way of doing that. It is similar to Creative Commons licenses. It's uh, basically a badging system for letting people know in a standardized way that um, you've done some due diligence on this and you think it's in the public domain. Um, so that's useful for sharing the entirety of the work itself. Um, and then we also have um, all of the resources that I've talked about today are here. Um, and that is all I've got. Um, we can take any questions or we can end a little bit early. This is all very detailed information for a Friday afternoon. Yes, so join us for the rest of the IAP sessions. I have another one on Tuesday about computational use, uh, one of the things that you might want to do with these public domain volumes. Um, and I think with that, we can give you the rest of your afternoon back.